But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. And to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. The word today that I want you to take home with you is prevention. In several areas I can think of in our lives today, we are majoring on prevention, whether it's war in Korea, noble efforts to prevent forest fires, untimely pregnancies, the field of medicine, most obviously, prevention works. So I go see my doctor periodically to forestall illness. In many good ways, prevention is utilized throughout our lives, except one in religion. In religion, it's remedial. Some folks don't come to church till a crisis hits and they need help beyond themselves. Some call it a fire escape faith, but call it what you will. When it comes to church, we are still in the curative stage. One Sunday in Providence, Rhode Island, an inner city congregation, we had street people frequent our Worship, they would hang out around worship because they think you're feeling guilty when you come out and you'll give them more money. <laughs> but I don't throw guilt on people. But this one dude, he was hanging out there uh, telling me one of those tales of woe. I listened to all the awful things he listed that he'd done to himself till he said, what would you do if you found yourself in the fix I'm in? That's when I had an opening. <laughs> I said, I'd never got there to begin with. <laughs> See, good religion is not an ambulance at the foot of a cliff to haul those who go over the cliff and crash at the bottom and take them to the hospital. Rather, it's like a fence at the top to keep them from going over in the first place. Our text is from a little-known book in the the. Uh, the epistle of Jude doesn't even have a, a chapter. Uh, it says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. How valuable is that? To keep you from falling. Now, we've been stumbling over ourselves since creation morning trying to get it right. And we never seem to be able to. But one purpose of the church, I believe, is to keep us from falling in the first place. You can see it in our prayers. You can see it in our hymnody. You know, rescue the perishing, you know that one, and old amazing grace that saves wretches like us. Church presupposes reformatory religion. Miraculous rescues are dramatic. And they get our attention more readily than mere prevention. I read this week where 97 terrorist attempts have been thwarted since 9-11. But nobody knows about it because it didn't happen. It's not something the mainstream media deems as newsworthy. Those things that are prevented. Not nearly as gripping as a sudden attack. The New Testament story of, of St. Paul in his conversion um, is a gripping story. He got knocked off his mount on the road to Damascus, blinded by the light, 
taken to a street called Straight and nurtured by the church back to faith. So he came to his senses. The pre-conversion Saul persecuted the church with great zeal. But the post-conversion Paul became the church's greatest missionary. Now that is exciting. But little is made of the preventive approach of John Mark. I doubt few people even notice it. Gradually developed into the faith from his youth, little by little, by his mama Eunice and his granny Lois. It was a natural, it was slow, and it was boring. <laughs> few of us are interested in routine inoculation. But let a faith healer show up with his magic. The people line the streets and unload their pockets. The promise of deliverance thrills the populace. But the appeal of a wasted life and then lifted back to fullness and usefulness and decency again? Yeah, the most popular biblical stories are those of miraculous recoveries. Moses parting the Red Sea. Uh, that's dynamic. David slew Goliath with a slingshot. The story of the prodigal son returning home. Far be it from me to belittle the power of God to cure. Still, I think something is to be said for the power of the church to prevent the need for a cure. Because the only thing that's far better than bringing that wayward son back home from the far country is keeping him from getting lost in the first place. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Why wait till we hit rock bottom before we crawl back up? Why not mold a healthy faith and character before the bottom falls out? Doesn't that make sense? Well, it does to me. Remember, somebody said it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Mm-hmm. It's like a fire truck. On ordinary days, nobody thinks much about them. But let a fire break out, and that siren becomes very important, especially if it's your house. <laughs> On the contrary, healthy spiritual life regularly developed week in and week out is infinitely greater than emergency measures that ambush us without warning, as life will do. Isn't that why we come to church? To put spiritual capital in our religious bank so something will be there when the time comes for us to draw out the funds that manage our crises. It's sound judgment in financial matters. While we say, lay a little back for a rainy day. But with our physical bodies, obviously, emergency tourniquets are a poor substitute for daily in and out good health. When I lived in Providence, we called it College Hill um, on Benefit Street. Don't you love that? When I lived there, I learned that Brown University was founded to educate 17th century preachers. It was meant for preachers, not students. <laughs> but the first gradu graduation included eight pastors. That's all. We do need to prepare for who knows what lies ahead. You have no way to prepare for the things we encounter. You just have to be ready for it and trust God. But it helps to have an education, right? We go to seminary to get a sound theological education. And I look around what's in today in our seminaries is this extemporaneous preaching, you know, with no notes. It ensures a lot of us and repetition and time. But the old way was to prepare ahead of time to make every minute count. I'm of the latter bunch. 
because my fading memory guarantees it. Now, I can do a children's story in like five minutes, <laughs> but after that, I, I, I forget and I stutter and I think, I wish I'd said that. I thought of it too late. So, I'll never forget the first time I preached in a real church. It was extemporaneous. I preached, wait for it, all of three minutes. <laughs> Because I hung around people down in South Carolina who believed it was a sin to use notes. Spontaneous inspiration is all you need. You don't take your finger and put it in the Bible and open it and just start preaching. I've never been able to do that. <laughs> but the people on that three-minute day, they, for, they felt cheated when I went from the book of Genesis to Revelation in 180 seconds. <laughs> And I sat down before some of them even got in the pews. <laughs> and the preacher looked at me and said, is that all? I better pull one out of my pocket. I mean, you can't use notes. <laughs> I could tell he was perturbed because he had to be a little extemporaneous a little bit. But that was the end of my winging it in the pulpit. <laughs> Since that humbling experience, I valued every single second before my congregation's time that I didn't want to waste a single second of it. I've even had folks that got upset because I prepare my prayers. You know that one? I guess I could use a monitor. <laughs> but I don't read my prayers. I pray them. Because I don't, I take praying as seriously as preaching. So I prepare. One is talking to God, the other is talking to people. Jesus said, don't pray on the street corners where you can show off how spiritual you are. Do it in private, do it in the closet, he said. It was just you and God. Take it seriously is what he means, I believe. Because anything we take seriously in religion and life, work, education, anything we take seriously should be prepared for. That's just common sense. Is someone any less inspired in the privacy of the study on a weekday than standing behind a pulpit in front of a crowd on Sunday morning? I think not. For a lot of folks, prayer is emergency only. I've heard a lot of them. They pray when a crisis occurs, and they ask for a supernatural rescue. The most effective praying, I believe, is regular maintenance of an interior spiritual relationship with God. Because those who don't believe in God, they never pray. They don't feel a need to. Jesus did. Jesus went to the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, but not because of a crisis to which he was unaccustomed. Note the brevity of his prayer. He did face an emergency. There were soldiers there with swords and spears. So there was little time for a composed, lengthy supplication. Jesus had developed a previous lifetime habit of praying. But somebody had to write it or else we'd never know about it. But with the soldiers, they came to rescue him. He relied on that old familiar path. Not my will, but thine be done. Don't you get the impression he said that over and over and over? And he pulled it up in the most uh, terrible crisis of his life. What power such few words, a moment of prayer, can be for one for whom it is habitual. This lesson applies to Father's Day today. And I enjoyed the blessing of having a wonderful dad. God love him. He didn't send us to church. He took us. He went with us. He was the best Sunday school teacher our church ever had. And I know that because nobody wanted to graduate from his class. <laughs> what does that tell you? We want to stay in Dan Ivins' class. See, when I go home, I'm Danny. <laughs> Because there's not but one Dan Ivins in my home, and I'm not him. 
So I had the NY on my name. But anyway, he would take kids an interest in, in his Sunday school class. He would give them lessons and tests on, on, on the, the lesson, and he would write it out, and uh, one that, that got the highest score would get a dollar. <laughs> and I, even the, the lowest score got a quarter. You know, and, and he'd take them on New, on New Year's to get fireworks, Roman candles, man. <laughs> and, and, and you think a kid didn't love that in summer, skinny dipping in the lake, winter, riding in the mountains, hot dogs and all this stuff, and marshmallows. And nobody wanted to promote. It was from my daddy that I learned to help people laugh and to make them think. But don't try to fool them. Another thing that rubbed off on me was his sincere generosity. As far back as I can remember, he would put a quarter in my offering envelope with my own number up in the right-hand corner, and I'd give it and contribute it every Sunday in Sunday school. Uh, yeah, it wasn't mine, but he wanted us to know the importance of giving to God and giving to others who don't have as much as we do. And you know what? Nobody had to teach me to drop my offering in the collection plate ever since. Everywhere we've lived, every church we've been a part of, it comes as natural as breathing. I got it from my daddy. He took the Bible seriously where it said, Train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Would that more fathers did that. Some lifelong habits that I learned in church is the value of prayer, and to respect the scriptures, and regular giving, and worship attendance, and, and putting my offering in the plate regularly. So I was trained from my earliest days as a kid by a dedicated daddy who was one who kept me from falling. This is my dad, and I miss him a lot. Around the turn of the century, there was a test for insanity before the practice of psychiatry matured. It was a simple test. The idea was to turn on a faucet and let the water run into a, a bowl. And the person being tested was asked to empty it with a cup. If he dips the water without turning the faucet off, it's a good bet his elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. <laughs> but if he's got enough sense to turn the faucet off before he dips from the bowl, he passed the test. When God tests, y'all, he grades on the cross, not the curve. So this Father's Day, let those who are sane among us raise the banner of deterrence in the name of him who is able to keep you from falling. Because it is eternally true. A single ounce of provision is worth a whole pound of cure.